right, so now I want to talk about the accounting identity or the accounting equation. I'm sure you've seen this before. Um, I hope you've seen this before. But perhaps you've never seen the beauty of it in terms of how it creates the system that we work in. Really, you could just walk away with this lecture um, from principles and, and really understanding it and how to apply it, and I would think you're ready. Um, unfortunately, I don't think it gets the sort of airtime it could in that course, um, or is it really exposed for the, 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 the underlying intricacies that are in there. So assets equal liabilities plus equity. Now, one thing we need to be very particular about is that this is only true at a moment in time. So I'm going to establish our time as December 31st, 21 for each of these items. And I just said things, something that should trigger, oh, wait a minute, right? Oh, these are the things that I find on a balance sheet. And I remember Professor Strasser just saying, these, uh, a balance sheet is at a moment in time. So this equation will only hold true if we assess each of its components at the same time. Now, where do we go from here? We can decompose something. And the first thing that we're gonna decompose, now we, we could de decompose assets into current assets and long-term assets, and then long-term assets further into like investments and, and, and PP&E and intangibles and current into cash and accounts receivable, but we're not really getting anything that's different. They're all still assets. Now, the one place where we see some real fundamental differences, aside from just when we're gonna recognize something, like in the coming year or beyond the coming year, um, is in equity. And so I'm going to further decompose equity. I'm gonna give myself some room here, move assets back. And we're gonna decompose equity into two pieces. Equity now becomes are capital accounts. I call them capital, and that is just referring to common stock, preferred stock, and, oops, just one P for preferred. I'm sorry, one P, one F, two R's. And um, that's all you really need to know for now. It would also entail additional paid in capital, APIC. It would also entail treasury stock. But for now, capital is good enough. And then we have that at 12, 31, 21. And then we also have retained earnings. Now, this is a big distinction. Both those capital or stock accounts are um, both capital and retained earnings are equity. So we can split it in two. What's the difference between these two items? The difference between the two items is this is an indirect investment. And these represent direct investments. So what does that mean? Direct investments come from external from the firm, right? We're getting someone to buy our common stock. We are getting someone external to buy our preferred stock. Indirect investments come from within the firm. They earn some money, they plow it back into the business. That is retained earnings. So now what can we expand? Well, the next meaningful expansion we can provide is on this retained earnings piece. And um, I'm gonna continue the subscripts at least for this one, because it becomes important. These are all still up here at a moment in time, but now we're gonna start introducing some things that happen during a period of time. So we're expanding this retained earnings piece. What does retained earnings summarize into? Well, it starts off with any beginning retained earnings, beginning of the period. So not 12-31-21 anymore, but January 1st of 2021, plus any net income that was earned over the year 2021. Now we have a period of time item, 
and subtracting off any dividends that were paid during 2021. So again, literally the earnings we've retained in the corporation because we start off with any beginning value here, we add in any earnings we made during the year, but then we only want to keep the earnings we retained. Well, we, we didn't retain dividends. Remember, dividends are a distribution. We paid that out. We did not retain them. And so that becomes a necessary component of retained earnings. Um, if the company is new, their original retained earnings would be zero. Okay? They didn't begin with any retained earnings when they're new because they haven't earned any income when they're new. They'll only earn income as they begin their operating cycle and start generating revenues and expenses over a period of time. Okay. So what can we then expand further? Well, in this case, net income can be expanded further. So now we have assets, and I will drop the 31 just for brevity, but Let's understand that it's at the end of the year. Liabilities at a moment in time. Capital at a moment in time. Plus retained earnings at the beginning of the year. So at 121. Sorry, that doesn't look very clear, especially at this resolution, 21. Um, we're going to expand net income. So how are we expanding net income? We're expanding it by what is net income comprised of? It's comprised of revenues. Revenues are a period of time item minus any expenses over that same period of time plus any gains over that period of time minus any losses in that period of time and minus dividends over that period of time. Be very uh, thoughtful when you're expanding things or working with equations in, the, in my class about parenthetical uh, mathematical operators. It doesn't really play a part here because we're adding both of the times that we've per parenthetically expanded a term. Um, but if this we were subtracting this, then it, it would it would cause some issues if you just wrote it out, um, because if this was anyway, hopefully you understand how to distribute negatives into a parenthetical um, expansion. That would be like an algebra skill, which which I assume we've taken algebra at this point. Um, anyway, just something to be aware of. This is net income. So we have this really expanded uh, thing. Now, one thing you can notice is that these are all of the elements that I defined in the statements of financial accounting concepts. We defined assets, we defined liabilities, capital is investments, retained earnings is comprehensive income that gets closed into equity. This is all comprehensive income. This is a distribution. So we've gone ahead and really laid out how one item that comes from the balance sheet can be can result into all of these items from other statements that are financial statements. One more interesting thing before I start going back into this and showing you how we've come up with the financial statements over time, it might be a little obvious. Actually, let's go ahead and look at that first because it's right here in front of us. This is a balance sheet. So folks said, hey, it might be a good idea for us to understand the balance sheet. Right? The balance sheet gets decomposed into these two pieces. This becomes my statement of stockholders equity. That is the official statement. A lot of folks that when I was polling about financial statements referred to a statement of retained earnings. That is not an official statement. But that would come here. It's sort of, it, it's not, the statement of retained earnings is not, it's a, 
an official statement. It is a piece of an official statement, but we can go ahead and identify it here. It is gonna be something we think about in Intermediate One. We're not going to analyze a statement of stockholders equity in Intermediate One, that's for Intermediate Two. But understanding where it falls is important. And this guy becomes the income statement. This also makes it more clear why there's an order of preparation in the statements because, well, I need to have a balance sheet, but wait, I can't have a balance sheet without knowing how my stockholders equity changed over time. So I have to have a statement of stockholders equity, but wait, I can't do that until I figure out what happened with retained earnings. Well, right, then I need a statement of retained earnings, that sort of mid-step unofficial statement on the way to stockholders equity but I can't do a statement of retained earnings until I understand what happened to net income. Well, that means I need an income statement. So I need to start here, figure out what my income statement's going to be. Then I can feed that into, boom, to net income so I can figure out retained earnings for the period. So we'll call this step 2.1. Two, my feed that into retained earnings in the statement of stockholders equity. This is my official statement of the financial statements in order to figure out what equity is going to be, which makes this the third statement. And where does statement of cash flows fit in? Well, basically we need the balance sheet and the income statement in order to derive a statement of cash flows. So that's why we have the four statements. It wasn't just that someone thought, oh, of course we need to know what assets, liabilities, and equity are. Right. Oh, but over here, for no apparent reason, we need to know an income statement. These things are all interrelated. They're all tied to each other. And that is really part of the beauty of the system of accounting. I mean, accounting was created during the Renaissance. And yes, a lot of other really even more wonderful things were. But if you consider up to that point in time, there was no logical closed way of thinking about how to record the transactions of a business until it was created during that time. The last thing I want to like kind of reveal to you is how does all of this tie into the rules for debits and credits? Now, typically this is just taught to you as, oh, it's an acronym. Remember this little cute way of remembering um, how to, what's debited and what's credited. Cute ways are all right, but they don't give us an underlying intuition of what's going on. They're a shortcut, and it doesn't allow us to really appreciate the underlying mechanics. So now what I'm going to do with this equation is bring everything that's negative over to the other side of the equation so that it becomes positive. So I'm going to drop the subscripts because we already know that some of these are periods of time. Some of these are at a point in time. But we have assets equal, uh, plus removing expenses over. We're moving losses over. We're moving dividends over. That equals liabilities plus capital plus retained earnings plus revenues plus gains, right? Everything's positive now. Right? Well, this doesn't seem to make a whole lot of apparent sense. Over here, we got assets, expenses, losses, dividends. Assets seem to be very much the opposite of these three things, which are all outflows and decreases to equity. Then we have liabilities, which are mixed with equity. Okay, maybe that makes sense because they're on the same side of the accounting equation. Okay, retained earnings is, is just another type of equity, but then those are mixed in with revenues and gains, which definitely seem different than liabilities. The, 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 what these items share in common, everything over here has a normal debit balance. Everything over here has a normal credit balance. 
And this normal debit balance, normal credit balance is a term to say um, they're increased by debits. They're increased by credits. So that is why these particular accounts have the rules of debit and credit that you've longed perhaps just assumed was an arbitrary rule that had no meaning. But now you can establish some meaning behind it. If anything can prepare you for understanding how everything is related, why we do the things we do, why we have the statements we have, why debits and credits follow the rules they do, why following the rule that every debit has to have an equal and opposite credit will also maintain the parity of the accounting equation, here's your source. It's not that hard. It looks like a lot. And I'm like, oh my gosh, all these timestamps and how am I going to memorize? You don't memorize. You think it through. You realize that you're starting at a point in time and then tell yourself the story as I told it to you in this lecture. So important. Um, you know, I would say if you walked away with this, I would be happy from intro, right? <laughs> so let's walk away with it now and carry it with us through the rest of the class. Um, I do want to cover just quickly how to do a journal entry in my class. There always um, has to be in a double entry system a debit and a credit. And debits and credits just mean left and right. That's all it means. It translates into a T account for any account that we have. This would be, you know, the journal entry debits or credits the account. Debits are on the left and credits are on the right. Debit and credit actually come from some Latin, I believe. It's, it's either, I believe it's Latin. Um, and debere and credere. And so debere just means left. Credere means, just means right. That's, that's all there is to that. Okay. Um, it ensures the equality of the accounting equation. Like I said, debiting and crediting by the same amounts. Keep assets equal to liabilities plus equity. Talk about the normal balances here. For this class, when you're working on a test, I need you to be precise with your journal entries. Many of you have not constructed well-organized, neat handwriting, and I don't know why you want to torture your, your professors this way. Believe me, when something is clean and neat, I am predisposed to liking it already. You want to make a favorable impression on the people grading your work. So in order to do a journal entry in this class, I want you to draw a line. And you've noticed me doing this. On the upper left of the line, put a number, like transaction number one, two, or a letter, A, B, C, anything that differentiates the journal entry. A lot of times, the best thing to do is to put the date. List all debits first. If there's multiple debit accounts, every debited account should be listed first they should be close to this line, very close. Indent the credit account number, right? And list all the credits after you've listed all the debits. Debit and credit numbers, these guys here, should be in separate columns. They shouldn't be stacked on top of each other such that it becomes really impossible to determine what you're debiting and crediting and numbers should never be in the same column with letters. So I don't want to see account title XXX, account XXX, right? We got to be very diligent about the formatting because otherwise it just looks like a big sloppy mess. Um, and for every transaction in this class, you need to start learning to identify what the debit to the account you just debited does to assets or liabilities or equity or net income. What the credit you did to whatever account does to assets, liabilities, equity, or net income. There will always only be one answer, like increase assets or decrease liabilities. It won't be both increasing and decreasing assets and liabilities. And in order to do that, I ask that you write it just outside that line. So for example, if I debit cash and I credit a bond payable. So I 
sold some promises of debt, promises to pay back somebody $10 million 10 years from now on the U.S. bond market, and I received $10 million million of cash for that. I would have my date, and then I would have, oh, well, this increased assets, this increased liabilities, and I follow all the other rules, okay? Pretty simple. I know some of you will still not do it well. I will deduct points if you do not follow these rules. Not a huge number, but it'll be enough that it'll add up over time and you won't be pleased that you couldn't even follow some really simple instructions, all right? So if you have any questions, of course, email, text, not, not text, sorry, that's just like, that just came out of my mouth. Um, <laughs> email, see me in office hours, um, ask me in class. I'm here for you. I'm here to help you. Um, I know this was a long series of lectures, and I promise that this is really the thickest in terms of me talking um, and having to cover a lot of concepts, right? Have a great one.